Everybody's trying to steal my lady Spiders in the mirror and things can be right Back to the scene of a Friday night To a blessed collision still frozen time Spill drinkers keep it in the sound of her first time And why did you argue? Dreaming of those eyes The best part of my life And when we make love, babe The world don't make a sound The clock won't turn around Things down when I want to race Catching up again when you travel to chase Feels like we're playing space You always find a way to make up right Even when we start to fly Even when things just run out You gotta soften up your sleeves, girl I'll never know Good afternoon, my friends. Hello, welcome back to another vlog. We're starting this vlog off on a Monday because that's just what we do. But truthfully, I really wanted to vlog my reading experience of Six of Crows and Crooked Kingdom. So I absolutely love this YA duology. This is seriously, these books are in my top 10 books of all time. Top 10 books of all time. I love them, I love every single part of them. And I truly think that they're pretty much perfectly executed fiction in all forms. <laughs> but there are a few things that I specifically want to talk about. I will be on the live show. We're doing a group read along, like a book club type of thing. You don't have to like, you know, if you want to read the books and come chat with us, it will be on McKay's channel later this month. But because it's not on my channel and I'm a guest and I think I'm going to have stuff to say that is more than the allotted time for a live show, I decided to vlog my rereading experience of these books. So I first found Lee Bardugo in 2018, I believe. I had been on a bit of a break from reading. I was just like really busy with work and raising my young family, and I didn't feel like I was finding books that were really hitting me. And so I just kind of stopped reading for a while. I did, I had, like, the previous year I had found Sarah J. Mass and read the books, those books, and then I continued to read them as they came out, but even though I loved those books, I enjoyed reading them. I don't know that I would say love, I didn't love all of them in the moment, you know? Even though I enjoyed reading them in the moment, they, they honestly, they didn't quite stick with me at the time as much as Six of Crows and Crooked Kingdom. These two books are really foundational to things that I love in fiction. They have so many things in here that I like. They have a really intricate plot. They have excellent, stellar, top-tier writing. Seriously, Lee Bardugo is a master at crafting really tight, meaningful prose. She is a master at character development, in my opinion. I think that the, the whole group of the crows that she's built in these books, they're so multifaceted. They have so much rich backstory. They have so much motivations. They have this connection, these relationships with each other and with other people. They come from different countries. They have all of just this incredibly rich material that she's crafted and put all of these, the, these misfits together that form this found family, which is another thing that I really, really love. I love Kaz and Inej the most. They are my favorite characters, so don't be surprised if this vlog basically just turns into me talking about Kaz and Inej and their relationship and what I think that says for romance readers and specifically what it says to, about my personal romance reading taste because 
truthfully, I think there are few things as romantic as what Kaz does in this book. And I'm not even kidding. This little thief bastard of the barrel, this complete criminal, he is, he does some things that are just so romantic that I literally will never get over. So I also feel like this book does something really interesting with the cast of characters, specifically Kaz, who is, he is a morally gray character. He's a morally gray hero. And I think a lot of times people refer to Lee Bardugo's previous books, the Shadow and Bone trilogy, and say that the Darkling is gray, or that was a point of conversation before. I think a lot of people have come forward and say, no, he's absolutely not gray he's a predator and he is you know i think that the darkling has a lot of appeal for women readers who see how he's treating alina and they see that he treats her with kindness really what he's doing is grooming her you know he's not a romantic hero he's not a, he's not doing any of that for her or with romantic motivations he has his own motivations and they are black they are not at all gray so anyway my point being, I think that Kaz is the ultimate morally gray character hero. I just love these books so much. So I'm currently listening to the audiobook and then I am going back through my paperback and annotating it. So you may get a lot of uh, commentary from me. I think you just might get a lot of commentary from me. <laughs> and that'll be okay, right? So right now I am about at chapter 13 and I'm going to go over my notes and then I'm going to come back and talk to you specifically about some things that that Kaz is doing and Inej in how they first meet and what that says about their relationship and motivations for the plot moving forward. So I will uh, be back when I have my notes gone over and I have some uh, better talking points, which is something I typically never do in a vlog, but I really want to do that with this one because there are some things that I'm picking up on that I want to make sure and address, but they're escaping my mind at the moment. So I will be back when I have more to say. Hello friends, happy Valentine's Day. Hello, hello. All right, so listen, I know yesterday I was like, I'm going to come back with my notes for Six of Crows, and I do want to do that, but I mostly want to talk about this book that I started on Sunday. So I started reading this book on Sunday. Um, I had just finished the Stacey Reed from last week. Usually, typically, typically a physical reading pace for me is one physical book I'm reading a week, only because the only time I really have to read is right before bed, um, and then on the weekend sometimes. So I didn't plan to vlog this, and then uh, I started it, and then last night I couldn't sleep, and I was up for several hours, and so of course I read this for hours. <laughs> it's a pretty long book, and I'm obsessed with it, and I needed to come and talk to you. So this book is the second in her series, and I actually specifically asked Caitlin from The Love Librarian, what is my hair doing right there? I asked her if I could read this before reading, is it Mile High? I think that's the first book. Because I do want to read that book, but I was more interested in this one. And she said, yeah, absolutely. So Jessen, my dear friend Jessen, finished this book and she's like, Crystal, I really think, like, not to pressure you, but I think you're going to really love this. And then Lizelle, sweet Lizelle, was like, uh, Crystal, I think that this, this book, I think you'll really like it. You need to read it. And then Chandler from Chandler Ainsley messaged me. She's like, um, you need to read this book. I think you're going to love it. And so here I am reading this book and 60% of the way in, I am absolutely loving this book. So I feel like something I've talked about in so many of my videos is how disappointed I feel with the current trends in romance publishing, specifically oh. indie romance. I feel like they're very much catering to that over dramatic, over the top, all of the spice, all like spice without anything else. I don't hate spice. That's the thing I want to like be clear about. I don't hate spice, but I need, I need, I, I, I need a little bit of something that's not just like, you know what I'm saying? I feel like if you're a woman and you're watching this, you got to know what I'm saying, right? Anyway, I'm sorry. Was that TMI? I'm leaving that in. So I've been really specifically missing a lot of good sexual tension and build up in the romance. I've been missing romantic romances. I've been just so sad. I haven't been finding any of that. This freaking book is so romantic. This hero is one of my favorite types of heroes. He's very like cold, closed off, doesn't really think that he wants, it doesn't want a relationship. He's actually technically at this point in the book, he's celibate. He says he is an NBA star. He's like this hugely popular, famous, amazing basketball player. So it's a sports romance in that way. And he was, we, I don't know exactly why, and I'm not going to spoil it for 
you, but he has had something happen to him with past relationships that has really made him, like, not trust women, not want to have a relationship, and just keep himself celibate and closed off in that way. So his sister is the heroine from the first book, and the heroine in this book, her name is Indy. She's best friends with Stevie, who is his sister. And Indy just came out of a really terrible relationship where she caught the man that she's been in love with her whole life, thought she was going to marry. You know, they'd been together for six years or something like that. She literally walked in on him sleeping with someone else in their bed. So she is absolutely emotionally devastated. She's just wrecked completely. And she's put so much of her life on hold for this man, and she's trying to reclaim that parts of it. But I will say that doesn't take a huge part of the story. This is first and foremost a romance, and I love that so much. I think that one reason why I particularly am fond of women's journeys sort of being centered is that a lot of times the romance doesn't hit hard for me. This book, the romance is hitting hard. 11 out of 10 on the romance scale. So... Anyway, these two end up coming together, this NBA player, Ryan, and Ryan Shea, and Indy, this heroine who is actually a flight attendant with the hockey team from the first book, they end up getting thrown together because Stevie, the sister of Ryan, is like, hey, can she just crash with you? She just ended up, you know, in a really bad situation. She doesn't have anywhere to go. She needs to save some money to get a place of her own and kind of get back on her feet while she works for this hockey team as a flight attendant. And so Ryan very reluctantly says yes. And he's very much the type of man who is very, con has a very controlled environment. He has a very controlling aspect of his life. And I think that's largely to alleviate his anxiety. So he wants things done a certain way in his home he thinks things should be done a certain way in his life and Indy comes in who is this girly girl passionate flowery loves color loves romance books loves iced coffee you know like there's a very specific line in here where she says have you heard of the phrase not like other girls and where she's talking to Ryan and he's like mm, yeah and she's like I'm I'm like other girls I am I like Uggs I like iced coffee and I really really love how the author leaned into that and made her a stare in a way a stereotypical girl girl who likes girly things, but she's not a stereotypical character. She still feels very fresh and unique. She's got her own personality, her own desires, her own motivations, her own background. And I think that is such an excellent example of really great characterization done with something that could very easily be a stereotype, but the way that it's handled with a lot of attention to detail, small things that do give her her own unique personality and that don't automatically lump her into the category of not like other girls, or a girl like other girls, you know what I mean? I just love her so much. But the thing that is really stealing the show for me is the hero, because not only is he very, like, closed off and not cold, but he's, like, got these walls up. He doesn't want to let anybody in, but he has this great moral code where he wants to do what's right. He has this insane work ethic. Like, he's just a good man. And let me tell you how much I adore a good man. I want to read about good men in my fiction. I want to read about them struggling, like, emotionally or overcoming things, but I'm so freaking tired of men who are abusive abusive, controlling a-holes. I'm just like, I don't want that in my fiction. I want to escape reality and read about a really great man finding love. And I don't understand why I feel like I'm the only one who wants that. I know I'm not the only one, but I'm having a not like other girls moment. Okay. Anyway. So the thing that I really love about this book is it has also has all of these very familiar tropes that don't feel tropey. Again, this author is so good at putting in tropes like there's fake dating, forced proximity, only one bed. Um, there's so many just tropes thrown in here that could, in the hands of someone who is less experienced and less well-versed at using her tool bag of writer writerly craft, that could come across very easily as, you know, tropey in a way that felt shallow, in a way that feels like I'm bored because th there's nothing fresh about these tropes. So this author does a great job of taking very familiar, well-loved tropes. Another one she did is a jealous, possessive hero moment, which, like, I swoon and die over every single time. I just love it so much. I really love how she's taking these conventions that are so familiar to the romance genre, but she's making them so fresh and unique, and she's really using her distinct voice to tell this story and give the characters their own voice. I'm obsessed with it. I love this book. This is a very talented author. I've been seeing her going around Mile High for a really long time. She first came on my radar because Jessen read Mile High because of Caitlin's recommendation, and then I was like, oh, 
okay, but you know, it was, it was one of those books that like I was interested in, but I didn't really prioritize it. But this book, the number of people who were like, who, people who know my taste, like Chandler knows my taste, Jessen knows my taste, Lizelle knows my taste really well, who were like, you gotta read this. So <laughs> you're right. Y'all are right. Excellent recommendation. Caitlin, excellent recommendation. I mean, again, I've got 40% of the way to go and I don't have, I won't be able to physically read this until tonight, right before I go to bed. Hopefully I'll have another night of no sleep so I can read it, but I'm obsessed with it. I love it so much. It's deeply romantic. There are so many things this hero is doing, like small gestures that are just so romantic. Like he builds her a bookshelf. He knows that she only likes iced coffee, so when he makes coffee in the morning, he puts a hot cup in the fridge for her, and just, like, little things like that that show that he's paying attention to her. I love that. I love how this author is using those moments to show he's paying attention to her, he has feelings for her, but he's she, he's not, like, doing over-the-top things. I just love it so freaking much. Also, also, the sexual tension in this book is off the charts. This book is hot, because there are so many moments where they're in that forced proximity where the fake dating relationship is coming into play where they both have feelings for each other but they like you know they have their reasons for not wanting to just go at each other and it's just delicious sexual tension excellency i think the last other contemporary author that i felt like did this really well in flawless and heartless is elsie silver so i am absolutely thrilled to have found another contemporary romance author who does that really well because this book is hot but it's not just like i don't want to be crass but you know like not just like right from the get-go like she's definitely working you and giving you the the sexual attention that I personally really want in my romances. So I'm very excited about this. I could see this being another six star read. Wouldn't that be great? Wouldn't that be great if the last two vlogs I do, I have a six star read. Okay. I am going to go in and work out. Uh, thank you for listening to me gush about this. I'm really, really enjoying it. Thank you to my friends for recommending it to me. And, uh, I'll come back when I have more to say, either about Six of Crows or about this. I'm sorry. This was going to truly be, I know you're probably not sorry, but in my mind, I always start these vlogs. I always start a weekly vlog with a plan. And then inevitably, my mood reader tendencies come out or something I'm reading. I'm like, I have to talk about this. And then I come and talk to you about it. So I don't know that I have a plan right now. I am. The audiobook I'm listening to is Six of Crows, and I'm going to continue listening to that throughout my workday. But I'm also, like, annotating it because I have thoughts about things she's putting down that I want to share. But, uh, yeah, the right move, so freaking good. Okay, I'll see y'all soon. <laughs> Hello, y'all. Okay, so I want to talk for just a minute about The Right Move by Liz Tom Ford. I'm now 70% of the way in, and I think this author is doing so many amazing things with this book. And I think that a lot of times... You know, romance gets a bad rap a lot of times. The people act like it's so easy, as if the as if the most complex of a human of human emotions, love, is easy to translate into fiction from your mind to the page to your readers. You know, and I I I at times when I'm extremely critical about romance, that's I I'm aware that this is this is a big undertaking that these authors are doing. And uh, here I am picking it apart. But, you know, that's what I do. This is a book review channel. But I think something that this author is doing that I'm very aware of is she is layering each element required in a romance very, very well. So she has a good amount of tension. She has a lot of these really quiet moments where the two of them are just being intimate and they're talking and they're sharing their feelings and then she's having other moments where you can just feel like the sexual tension, like you're just like, please kiss, like, or more, you know, you can just feel it so well. She has the, the outside forces of why they're in a fake relationship all contributing to that as well. She has really good pacing. She has really good dialogue and banter. She uses descriptions really well so that it never feels overly described. And, it, and I'm not even really aware of the writing, which like chef's kiss, hallelujah, my favorite in the entire world. I'm just completely lost into this story. There is something specific she's doing with the sex scenes in this book that I want to talk about. And this is something that I typically never talk about because I prefer for my videos to be PG. That's just my own personal opinion. Anybody else can do whatever they want, but that's what I want to do here. So I feel like the very first pretty heavy intimate scene is entirely from his point of view. It's his point of view 
he is, and, and that I think works so well to say so much about this hero because it's his point of view and he's talking about how he's feeling in that moment, what is exciting to him, how much he wants her, and he's paying attention to the little tiny things about her that is just like driving him absolutely wild. And one of them are just the noises, the sounds she makes when she says his name, things that she's doing with her hands, the way her face looks and her body, like, but it's never in a like lascivious manner. It's never in a, just a horny manner. It's never at all just only about how she looks. It's all layered with this emotion of the feelings he's had building up for her over time while she's been living with him. He wants to take care of her. He has these feelings for her. So in this moment when they are finally together, all of that is shown in how he's noticing things about her. And that's just adding layer upon layer about his feelings for her. So we know that he loves her. It's so wonderful. It's so, so good. I just loved it. So that was when he was paying attention to her. And then the scene flips to where she is paying it back, paying attention to him. And she's the one whose point of view that we're in. And we're doing the same thing with her. We're seeing everything through her point of view. We're seeing what it is about him that attracts her. And we're having these little moments where she's noticing things about his personality or who he is. And, and both of them have this feeling of, I'm so lucky to be with this man that he's mine and she's mine. And it's literally perfection. This is romance novel perfection. I'm obsessed with this book. I'm thinking about it all day. I'm sitting here working and all I want to do is get back into these pages and read it. I think this author is incredible. I'm absolutely incredible. I just love everything that she's doing in here. I have literally not a single complaint. Not a single complaint. And like, how often does that happen? Right? Anyway, Six of Crows, yes, we've forgotten her for a moment. <laughs> not really. I'm still reading it. But Obviously, the book that is at the forefront of my mind and heart is The Right Move. I am obsessed with it. It's fantastic. It's so well done. I think also the sex scenes in this book are very much used to propel the relationship forward, and therefore I think they're doing a lot of work, and therefore it's my favorite type of spicy book. So this is just, this is just the best book. I love it so much. So uh, yeah, there you go. I'll come back later later on hello my friends okay i made my breakfast and i'm gonna eat it in just a second but i finished the right move and this is oatmeal by the way if you can hear that <laughs> that was a six star read for sure that was such a beautiful romance there i feel like this I feel like to me this book was a perfect romance even though uh, typically I think I do tend to prefer books that go to like a really really sad place that they have to like pull themselves out of and I, I just like that type of thing. I really like to have a lot of conflict and turmoil but I want it to feel like realistic and that's one reason why I, I always talk about Kennedy Ryan is because I think that she does that so well. But this book was just it did have some darkness, but it never, like, dwelled there. There are some serious issues in here, like, you know, Indy, the heroine Indy, her husband, she caught him cheating on her, and she wants to be a mother. She's dealing with some infertility things. She wants to be a mother more than anything in the whole world. And the hero has a lot of baggage, too, some pretty severe emotional trauma that he's trying to work through. But the conflict with them as a couple was not huge at all, I didn't think. I felt like it was handled really well. I think this was just such a beautiful book. There was a moment towards the end where the hero, the hero does a huge grand gesture. Like, it's so freaking beautiful. But there was one specific moment that had me tearing up that I was surprised that that was what it was. And it was just something so simple as remembering and making things that she liked to eat and drink and taking care of her. It, that's the thing that always gets me in romances. It's not so much the huge grand gestures, even though I'm like, wow, that's so beautiful. But there is a part of me, especially considering this grand gesture in this book, that while I love that and it was so beautiful, I also really feel like I, I want a little bit more of realism. And, you know, there aren't very many women who are going to marry an NBA star and have the funds and finances that he has, you know? So I, it's fun to read about, but the things that really like get me, that hit me are those moments that feel 
very realistic. Like, just remembering how she likes her coffee. Remembering that she likes iced coffee and putting it in the fridge. Remembering that, you know, she's going somewhere and she's a vegetarian. And so you take her, like food that she can eat though those small little things just really mean a lot to me so i absolutely loved this book it was so freaking beautiful it was perfect in like every single way i think this is truly one of those romances that just feels very very perfect it's so epically romantic just beautiful has so many things that i personally love but again the thing that i think that this author does so well is not only does she have those big, huge, grand gesture moments that are romantic and swoony and like the stuff that movies are made of, but she has so many of those small little ones that make it feel believable and real. And that's something that I'm just always, always looking for. I want it to feel real. I want it to feel believable. And this one just did it. So I loved it. It was six stars. It was such a good read. I loved it so much. And I just know that like nothing is going to compare to this. This was fantastic. So... I'm so thrilled that I picked that up, and I actually read it way faster than I thought. Thank you, Insomnia. <laughs> it was wonderful. I loved it. And I didn't read the first in the series. I am going to go back and read that, but if you also haven't read the first, you could definitely pick this up. The hero is one of my favorite all-time, like, all-time favorite heroes. This man is out of his mind in love with this woman and just shows her in every possible way. It was so good. So... Yes, six stars for this one. Absolutely recommend. Thank you to everybody who recommended it to me. It was fantastic. And uh, I'll come back with another update when I finish Six of Crows. Because I have like some thoughts about that compared to what I feel like is a very perfect romance novel. Anyway, I have some thoughts and I'll come back with them. Staring at the window on a cloudy morning Trying to lick her wounds while the tea is warming Sometimes it's like a bird has never shipped out Sometimes you go around and I never run the rail This week has been a mess but I'm gonna tell you We're a bit at work, gonna make it brand new We're gonna play the way for I come back We all in the sun time and I promise you that finished Six of Crows. Hi, Kazi. I finished Six of Crows. I did end up reading it entirely through audiobook. I mean, I, I went through and I tabbed a little bit of the first few chapters, mostly just Kaz and Inej <laughs> and their first meeting, like how they ended up coming together and things like that. But of course, the week just kind of got, the work week kind of got away from me and I just... I just didn't have the time, frankly, to sit down and read it physically and annotate it, which makes me sad. And I feel like I did. I also did that with Longshot. I'm not finished annotating Longshot, and I don't know that I'll ever get back to it. But my my idea is always like I want to annotate as I read, but then when I'm listening to the audiobook, that's a little bit harder. Children, children, don't mind them. They're just playing. Anyway, I'm gonna put this down and put a picture in of this book. So I finished Six of Crows and. I gave this five stars. The first time I read this book, I gave it five stars. I think it is truly so incredible in so many ways. However, I can say that in the beginning, I said it was a near perfect book. I don't believe that it is anymore, having reread it and having seen some of 
the flaws that I was very, very willing to overlook the first time I read it. Children! Apologies, apologies. I think that if you are a first time reader of this series and you aren't, you're not already connected to the characters, I think that it is very slow in the beginning. And I think that's largely because Leigh Bardugo does such a, I think she does a really good job. Oh, poor timing. Should we go to a different location? Let's go to a different location. Listen, children, children, children. They're not listening to their mother. Oh, that's because they don't respond to children. <laughs> Good puppies. Okay, let's go film. All right, hello. We're now in the kitchen where the dogs aren't <laughs> hopefully going to bother us. So, Six of Crows. I, I don't, I no longer think that it is a perfect book, although I think it is extremely impressive. The beginning is slow. And, I know I already said this, I'm backtracking. I think the reason that, the obvious reason that it is so slow is because she's providing you not only with an introduction to the characters and an introduction to this new world of Ketterdam, which is, in my opinion, sort of like the underbelly, like Victorian England is what I think of it to be. And she's also providing you with the backstory of these characters. And the backstory is so incredibly important to the entire book because that provides information and details for who these characters are, why they do the things they do, how they ended up where they're at today. But it also shows you, and this one I think is really interesting, it shows you how they end up bonding with the love interest in the books. And I just honestly love that so freaking much. The two main love stories that I feel like I'm focusing on the most, obviously, are Kaz and Inej and Matthias and Nina. And both Kaz and Matthias are, I think, watered, not necessarily watered down. They are not as bright, not as strong romance hero archetype. So Kaz, I think, is very much the villainous type of hero, even though he's not a villain. He's morally gray, like I said earlier. He is, you know, the mob boss, the mafia. He's the the crime lord of the city. Inej is his weakness, his one weakness. She is what he wants more than anything in the entire world. But mostly in this book, also spoilers. I'm going to talk about spoilers for the romantic relationships in Six of Crows. I'm not going to talk about spoilers for the plot, but I am going to talk discuss romantic relationship things. So I don't know if you would even call this a spoiler because I'm only talking about the first book, obviously, but I am going to be talking about some scenes. So, Inej is who he wants most in the entire world. And Inej is such an interesting character because at her core, I think Inej still truly believes that people are good, even after everything that she's been through, being sold into slavery, being forced to work as a prostitute, everything that she has had to do, even working for Kaz and trying to maintain that balance of I can still be a good person, I can still believe there are good people out there while I'm still doing all of these things. And we see that when, in the opening scene, when we meet her and Kaz, and Bolliger gets shot, and she is so conflicted, she wants to stay and help him, and Kaz is like, no, you know, he made his choice. He's no longer one of us, we're gonna leave him there. And you can see that there's a few short paragraphs where Inez just really grapples with the fact of, I don't feel like we should leave him, he's one of us, he's part of our family, our found family. But then she recognizes that Kaz is right, and even though she doesn't want to, she agrees, and she leaves him there. But she leaves while saying a prayer. Her daggers, her knives are so dear to her. Not only are they a weapon, ob obviously, obviously they're a weapon, but they also, I think to her, they demonstrate that she now has autonomy over her body. She's not a slave anymore. She's not a prostitute anymore. Those knives are a way for her to be free, just the same as her shoes are that she had made by the fabricator. Her shoes that make it so that she can climb and be the wraith, the spider. Both of those things are keys to her owning and mastering herself. And who is it that has granted her that? Kaz has. Why did Kaz do that? One, because obviously she is a vital part of his team, but also the biggest reason, the one he doesn't want to admit to herself, to himself, and that she, at this point, is pretty unaware of, although I think she's starting to get an inkling. He did that because he cares for her. I wouldn't call it love yet, but he cares for her. 
This is the same reason why he allowed her to not get the crow's tattoo. He wants her to have bodily autonomy, not because he thinks that women deserve bodily autonomy, not because he thinks people deserve bodily autonomy, but because from the moment he saw Inej, he felt something for her, and she is the only goodness about him. His love for her is the only good thing about her. And this is why I say that Kaz is the superior villainous hero. I mean, the Darkling is sexy and all, right? Ben Barnes, we're not even talking about him. That man is beautiful. But the Darkling is only ever in it for his best interest. There is not a single part of him that would protect Alina, that would do anything for her. We wish the story went a different way, that he behaved more like Kaz did, where Kaz literally, in a moment when Inej got stabbed, when the ship was exploding, when Inej got stabbed, Kaz went on a killing spree. He decimated. Jesper said he had never seen so much blood. Why did he do that? Did he do that because his mission was endangered? He wasn't going to get his million Kruga? No, he did that because Inej was in mortal peril and he was a man who became unhinged in that moment. And this is why I feel like Lee Bardugo definitely loves romance and Kaz is one of the best morally gray romantic heroes, mob boss heroes I've ever read in my life. But again, nothing about him is over the top. Nothing about his feelings for Inej are over the top. So I think that for a lot of romance readers, you're going to get frustrated reading this because the parts where he behaves like that are so minimal that we're used to getting it page after page after page. But I find it to be so beautiful because he has so much restraint and because he doesn't even know about those feelings he has. He doesn't want to examine them. You know, when they get on the ship and they're going to safety and Nina is healing Inej and she's no longer in mortal peril, Kaz cannot bring himself to go and see her. He can't bring himself to talk to her about how she almost died. He can't do it. And she reads that as coldness when really it's the fact that he cannot bear the idea that she perished from this earth. It's so freaking romantic. It drives me absolutely crazy. I can't even stand it. I love so much. I love so much. You know, we, we joke around. We talk about it. It's a favorite trope. He's going to kill everyone. He's going to kill everyone but her. Maybe that's not exactly the right. Please don't demonetize me. But, you know, like, he's going to burn down the world for her. The man literally did. He went on a killing spree because somebody stabbed her and she was in danger. While she was in his arms, while he is a disabled person walking with a cane. Which brings me to another reason why, not just because he loves her, is her bodily autonomy so important to him, but I think it also has a lot to say for the fact that he knows what it's like to not be in control of your body with his disability and his limp that does restrain him from being able to fight off everything, you know, which is why he has like hired muscle and things like that. So because he knows what it's like to not have full bodily autonomy when someone that he cares about, when he has an opportunity to provide them with that, he's going to do it. And the only person he cares about, the only person he cares about in the world is Inej. It's just so friggin' beautiful. It's just so friggin' beautiful. I can't even stand it. I can't even stand it. I love my babies. I love them so much. They're perfection in every way. So yeah, this book is fantastic. <laughs> and I'm not saying that everybody is going to feel the same way, but I love this book. And one of the main reasons I love it, it is so hugely character driven. Everybody talks about how this is a heist book. That's what it was like pitched at when it was first being sold. But to me, it's never been about the heist, although that is, I think, extremely clever. And the continuation of it in Crooked Kingdom is, again, like 10 out of 10 cleverness. But what really sells this book to me is the characters. It's so hugely character driven. And it only is that way because of the backstory that you're getting that is interwoven with the characters. So you get flashbacks to their past, what happened to them. And then you get this moment in the real life where they're maybe reflecting or thinking about that. So the multiple points of views in this could be difficult to, I think, keep up with. And I, I definitely feel like you've got to be committed to reading this at first. If you're not used to a slow pace, if you're not used to, like, slow reveals, if you're used to, like, you know, sex on the first page, you're probably not going to like this, to be totally honest. But if you've sort of been dying for some really light, and you haven't read this by chance some really layered character work, but also very specifically those very layered, very subtle romantic moments. Because in that scene, when Kaz like goes absolutely bananas and just like 
destroys everyone around him. It's never ever mentioned on page the reason why he does that. It's only implied. It's implied to the reader that absolutely the reason that he went on a killing rampage was to protect Inej, the woman that he loves. And I say woman, I do feel like this book reads very maturely and I wish so badly it had been written as an adult because there's a part of me that's like, really they're 16 and 17. It's hard for me to believe, but I don't even care. I picture them older. I, in my head, they're older. They're not children. <laughs> And I do think that, uh, I don't know, I tried to get my boys, my teenage boys, when they were of age to, or, you know, an age where I thought they would appreciate this to read it, and they were bored out of their mind. So I'm sure there are teenagers who read and love this, but my boys were like, absolutely not. But they did like The Hunger Games, so, which is definitely a fast-paced book. Anyway, this is a very rambly clip. I hope you enjoyed my thoughts, my little uh, gush fest over Kaz going on a killing spree, and the way he feels about Inej, and how she feels about her... Also, I didn't even talk about the fact that Inej's religion is so important to her. She names her blades after the saints. But who is Kaz's religion? You guessed it, Inej. Oh, I just love it so pretty much. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm going to end this vlog here. I did not ever end up coming up with bullet point points. I mean, I was going to, but, you know, life, it's been a busy week. It's been a hectic week. It's been a, it's been a week, y'all. And uh, those are my thoughts. That's what you get right now. So... I hope you enjoyed this vlog. It was a bit chaotic. There was no plan. Uh, if you haven't read The Right Move, I want you to read it because it was very, very wonderful. Thank you so much, Caitlin, Lizelle, Jessen, Chandler, for encouraging me to read it and listening to me gush about it because it was absolutely beautiful and perfect. And uh, yeah, so I will say that the interesting thing is, is that The Right Move gave me everything I wanted as a romance and it didn't give it to me in an over-the-top way, in an in-your-face way, but a perfectly perfectly presented romantic slowly at times fast at times evolving pace whereas this Kaz and Inej satisfies my desire for more subtle nuance and layers while at the same time I'm always left wanting more with these two but I will never read fan fiction of them so don't even don't even come at me in the comments because I I just don't believe that it can be done <laughs> I don't believe it can be done in a way that I would love because I like their slow build slow burn slow to confess not over the top relationship, but the right move was absolutely beautiful. Okay, for real, I'm done now. Thank you so much for watching, my friends. I hope you enjoyed this video, and uh, please leave me a pink heart if you made it this far for Valentine's Day, and I'll see you in my next one. Mm -hmm.